writer and science communicator with a lifelong interest in nature, focusing on wild plants from the age of seven. He grew up in Wiltshire, where he taught himself how to identify the local flora and is currently based in Oxford. His first book, The Orchid Hunter, was published in 2017. So now I'm delighted to hand over. Thank you, Kira. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're all well. Um, this morning, it gives me enormous pleasure to be uh, introducing my new book for the very first time. Um, but before I say anything, I must uh, ask you very kindly uh, not to share anything on social media about this for now. Um, I was hoping, well, I was told that the book announcement would have happened by now, but it hasn't been. Uh, we're still waiting for the front cover to be finished, uh, which looks amazing. And I'm so, so excited to share it. Uh, but yeah, it's still still being uh, tinkered with. So for now, if we could just keep this uh, as a little secret between us, that would be amazing. So uh, having said that, I'm now going to spend the next 10, 12 minutes uh, making you all very jealous uh, because I've had the most unbelievable year. I'm still having the most unbelievable year, uh, traveling around the country, uh, exploring Britain and Ireland's botany um, and having a lot of fun writing about it as well. So uh, the new book is, just to give you a little uh, summary of the whole thing, uh, it's exploring our contemporary relationship with Britain and Ireland's wild plants. So this is everything from trying to understand why we as botanists and plant enthusiasts uh, love wild plants so much, why there are far fewer of us than there are animal enthusiasts, and trying to work out what it is about plants that intertwined our lives with theirs in the first place. And so what I've done is I've been on this big adventure through the seasons uh, all around the country. Uh, so I started um, on 1st of January doing the BSBI New Year plant hunt uh, with my mum in the rain in the middle of London, uh, looking for little street plants. And since then have been on all sorts of adventures all over the country, uh, trying to track down uh, some of our most well-known plants, uh, the plants that uh, most people have heard of at least. So things like, you know, bluebells, poppies, daisies, uh, as well as uh, some of our more uh, unusual, intriguing, intriguing plants. Um, but best of all, um, I've had the absolute privilege uh, to go on all sorts of plant hunts with um, people who have some kind of connection to their local flora. Uh, so that in some cases, that's professional botanists who've been you know, looking for plants for years and years. And then in other cases, people who've only discovered um, them more recently, or perhaps just enjoy walking through their landscapes, not necessarily knowing that much about what the individual plants are, but just um, sharing their appreciation um, of the sort of landscapes that they, that they build up. So the, basically there are two things which I've tried to achieve with, or I'm going to try and achieve with this book. And um, the first thing is I want to show people who, you know, may never have um, stopped to notice wild plants or may have just dismissed them as being boring. Um, I want to show the kind of the depth of delight that it is possible to experience um, walking through uh, the places they call home, uh, spending time looking at them and, and going to hunt for them. And the second thing is kind of offering an insight into the ways in which I and all these amazing people who I've met with, um, how we kind of go about engaging with plants and forming that those connections with them. Because I think often people who say have some kind of interest in nature, uh, but, that, but perhaps on an animal side of things, they don't really know how to sort of get started with plants. And so I think one of the aims of the book is trying to show that it's actually really easy and giving all these ways in which I uh, spend time with plants and with all these amazing people um, do that too. So hopefully um, offering people a kind of way into, uh, into botany. So um, basically I, yeah, sort out a load of our best known plants, as I said, so things like daisies, bluebells, dandelions, poppies, uh, these plants that 
are wrapped up in folklore and British botanical history. And, um, you know, the, their names are still known to most people, um, in my experience anyway. Uh, they may not know what they look like, but they have at least heard, heard names like Daisy and Dandelion. So they're sort of scattered through the book. Uh, what I also did was uh, hunt down some of our coolest uh, plants with the best biology. Uh, obviously, so many people just dismiss plants as being boring. Um, but even here in the UK, we have some absolutely amazing things. And I've just, I've been wandering around just completely um, mind boggled the whole year. It's been so good to kind of see all these things at once um, and kind of try and um, bring them all together and to sort of reveal this amazing botanical diversity that we have here in Britain Island. So just a few examples. Um, we had Lords and Ladies in spring, uh, spring woodlands, and this kind of really bizarre plant um, with this phallic structure in the middle called a spadix, which actually um, is capable of heating up to 14 degrees above uh, the ambient air temperature, which is just phenomenal. If you think about this flowers in the spring so it's kind of, the air temperature is kind of already 15 16 17 degrees so this thing can actually heat up to more than 30 degrees um which is obviously such a such a mammal thing to do to be able to heat yourself up uh, so that's a really cool plant then you've got your carnivorous plants the classics the sundews the bladderworts the butterworts um, and all the amazing ways in which they uh, trap insects and, and invertebrates um, and consume them uh, to boost the, the nutrients they're getting from the environment. Then you've got your parasites uh, that Chris has just talked about, the broom rapes and things. Um, so these plants that just take the, the how to be a plant rule book and chuck it out the window uh, and kind of do their own thing. And then um, you've got this insect uh, mimicking flower um, of the fly orchid. I haven't talked too much about orchids um, just because I've already written about those. Um, but they are scattered through uh, through the year as I've as I've come across them, uh, because they obviously they are such a draw to get people into botany um, as well, because they look pretty spectacular. But along the way, um, the most important thing for me has been trying to condense some of our most iconic uh, botanical landscapes into words uh, to try and get across how how much of the landscape they sort of make up. My interest in botany uh, when I was a teenager was very much focused on finding the rare plants. Um, and I was constantly trying to track down uh, rare things, to tick them off lists, to take photos of them. Uh, but now, 10 years later, I, I get the most joy out of seeing how the plants make up uh, the world around me. So some of the key places um, or the landscapes that I wanted to include, uh, things like the Southwest Coast Path, where you've got that amazing, those amazing banks of kidney vetch and thrift and uh, sea campion and things, and how they have that backdrop of the cliffs behind and, and that environment. Uh, then you've got our bluebell woods, which are obviously just one of the most famous landscapes we have in the country. Um, I went on this amazing adventure um, along the South Downs Way from Winchester in Hampshire, all the way down to Eastbourne in Sussex and um, explored all the bluebell woods along the way. And I stopped to chat to literally anyone um, who I encountered uh, and got a real sense of why we love bluebells so much and why people um, actively seek out these places to go for walks. And then other landscape, you know, just a few examples. Um, the, the Arctic Alpine flora in Scotland. I had this amazing day with Sarah Watts um, up on Ben Laws in, in the Highlands, just seeing some of these ridiculously colourful, very, very small plants growing up on the mountains with these amazing backdrops of mountains uh, in Scotland. Um, and then, yeah, another day floating around on a boat um, on the Norfolk Broads with Joe Palmenter looking for aquatic plants. Um, and seeing some of our water lilies, uh, bladderworts, and all those all those amazing plants, I had never really thought that much about aquatic plants. Um, but that day just completely blew my mind. Uh, they just do some unbelievably cool things uh, to survive in water. So yeah, it was it's a lot. A lot of the book is trying to get across that kind of sense of the way that plants just make up uh, the world around us. 
So over the course of the year, I've uh, covered quite a lot of the, quite a lot of the country. Uh, these red dots represent um, all the places that I've been to that will be included in the book. Um, I've got a fairly good coverage uh, of the country. Um, I didn't get to Ireland quite as much as I would have liked, uh, but you can thank COVID for that. Um, but I did get a, a couple of times. Um, and along the way, while I have been focusing on uh, the common plants and the plants that sort of uh, define the habitats that I visited, uh, I have encountered either by chance or I've been shown them by very excited botanists, um, all sorts of rare plants, which has been um, really, really special. So to give you a few examples, um, I had this amazing day in the Cairngorms with Gus Routledge and um, looking at pine forests. And there we found twin flower, which is a species I've wanted to see, uh, you know, a, since I first picked up a wildflower guide. Um, in Northern Ireland with Donna Rainey, um, we found a load of walled caraway, which is this really, really beautiful uh, umbellifer in the carrot family. Down on the Lizard Peninsula, uh, that really famous botanical site with a load of rarities. Um, I went there with absolutely no information um, about where the rare plants grew. I wanted to see how many I could find um, without any information at all, just by walking around. And one that I managed to managed to find was this uh, little yellow pea uh, called hairy greenweed. Then all the way up at the other end of the country, um, I went all the way out to Shetland um, and met John Dunn, where we went uh, plant hunting for the very rare Edmonston's chickweed, which is a stunning little plant uh, growing on this bizarre gravelly hillside. Uh, which is the only place in the world where it grows. So that was a real, real honour to meet that one. Uh, we had cornflowers, which obviously are not necessarily too rare because they appear in um, seed mixes so often these days, but it was the first time I'd seen it in an arable setting. So that was really exciting. And then I had this amazing day on Salisbury Plain on the best chalk downland I've ever seen in my life. Uh, which is saying something because I grew up uh, grew up on the chalk and uh, yeah had some amazing plants there one of which was this uh, purple milk vetch. So yeah I fitted I fitted in a lot this year um, you may be wondering how I got around um, so when I was as a teenager I did all my botany by bike uh, I cycled around the countryside and it was just the best way to go and find things I could cover lots of miles um, and see everything along the way. And so this year, with the help of trains, um, I've been cycling everywhere. Uh, this is my bike on Shetland, yeah, it's on Shetland, um, all kitted out for a week of camping. And it's just been the best thing to sort of go back to how I botanized as a teenager. Um, because you, you, you don't just get uh, the plants at the start and the beginning, of course, you get the plants all the way along, all the way along your journey. And um, so I was constantly stopping off on row verges um, to visit little woodlands or bits of downland um, as I was cycling along. And so the book is very much my adventure through the year uh, on my bike as I as I travel around the country. Um, yeah, so I can't tell you much about I can't tell you the title. I can't tell you who's publishing it. Um, it is coming out June next year, so there isn't too long to wait. Uh, but I hope that gives you enough of a, an idea of what it's going to be about um, that you might want to go and purchase a copy. Um, and yeah, do keep an eye out for uh, the announcement, which will be coming soon. And yes, thank you if you could avoid posting about it on social media for now until the announcement. Uh, that would be great. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Um, it's amaz amazing to hear about your new book and I'm really looking forward to when that's published. Um, we have time for just one question, if that's okay. Um, Louise, do you want to ask it or should I go ahead? If we've only got time for one question, um, Kylie asks, when writing a book, does Leif have a clear idea of what he wants to write about, or does that sort of develop as he goes about his travels? Mm -hmm. So a quick answer, if you don't mind, Leif, because we've overrun a tiny bit. Uh, okay, quick answer. Uh, yes, in this case, this was very, very planned. Um, right from the beginning, I had um, a big overarching idea. I had all the chapters planned. 
Um, I've had to make a lot of changes because of COVID, either because I couldn't get there or other people couldn't do things. So I've had to uh, be adaptable along the way. Uh, but yeah, it has been very planned. I, the, the idea is now three years old. Um, I've been waiting to tell people about this for two years. Um, but yeah, I can finally almost, almost um, start talking about it publicly. But um, yeah, it's all very planned. It's the Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Leif. Back to you, Kira. Thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks for presenting.